Hello and welcome to another synthetic biology lecture from the University of Washington. Today I'm going to talk to you about reporters. So by now we're fairly familiar with the idea of DNA and its uses in, in synthetic biology, but how can we actually tell that the gene of interest is actually being coded for? So first let's take a step back and we have a promoter here and a particular gene of interest here that we wish to be coded for in E. coli. So we're going to put this plasmid into a little microorganism, E. coli, which is something very commonly used in synthetic biology, E. coli. But how are we actually sure that it's getting put in? How are we actually sure that this promoter is functioning and that our gene of interest is being coded for? And on that matter, how are we sure about how strongly that promoter is working? That is, how much of that gene of interest it's coding. So as a way of testing these three things, we need something called reporters. And <coughs> there are several different types of reporters that can be used. We have fluorescent uh, chromoprotein, we have chromogens, and luminescent proteins that are all used. So I'm going to do a quick rundown of what each of those are. So first off, we have chromoproteins, and this is a very simple concept in that all it is is a protein with a color. So chromo, meaning color, and protein. And so say we had a chromoprotein that was very strongly yellow. Um, so we would then put in, a tat uh, instead of this gene of interest, we could put in this chromoprotein that is yellow and our reporter would then produce this yellow pigmented protein, just draw it here, produce this at a specific quantity that is determined by the promoter and the transcription factors. That would then give us an idea of how, how strong that promoter is and how much of our gene of interest it's going to create when we then put in our actual gene of interest instead of the chromoprotein. Um, Another type of reporter that we have uh, uses chromogen. So as an example, the most commonly used chromogen is a protein or a molecule called X-gal, not, not a protein, X-gal, which is eaten up by an enzyme known as beta-galactosidase. And what that does is it consumes, so I'm just going to draw beta-galactosidase. This is beta-galactosidase. Um, it consumes X-gal and it produces glucose and a blue pigment. So this reaction produces a uh, glucose, uh, glucose and a blue pigment plus a blue pigment. And so by this reaction happening and putting beta-galactosidase in this coding region, um, we can then also quantify how strong our promoter is by measuring the quantity of the blue pigment that is present afterwards, after we introduce X-gal into the system. It's also a good way of testing whether or not our plasmid actually got put into E. coli because we can then plate E. coli onto a medium. so. If we have a, a culture plate here, uh, we can plate it onto a medium that actually has this X-gal as its food source. So the only colonies that will survive are the ones that uh, produce beta-galactosidase, which we have put onto this nifty little plasmid that we've introduced. So all of the E. coli that doesn't get the plasmid will die and not be able to reproduce and all of the ones that are able to reproduce will create nice little blue colonies all over the place that we can then pull off. And in the situation that I just mentioned, uh, it's important to note that our coding region for beta-galactosidase is actually going to be in a different spot on, on our plasmid. So I'm actually going to put beta-galactosidase over here, and it's going to code as well as our actual gene of interest. And that way, um, we are able to select out the colonies that grow, or that actually got the plasmid, 
and have the gene of interest that we expected it to have. So we have we're using this plasmid to coat for two different products. One of them is the reporter and the other one is the actual gene of interest. And that situation can also be used to test whether or not our gene of interest is being coded for. So we could say use the exact same promoter that we used in this region up here on for beta galactosidase and then we know that if beta galactosidase is being coded for then also our gene of interest is being coded for and it can be a way of quantifying that as well. Now another type of reporter is uh, luminescence proteins and if you google bioluminescence you'll come, a come across a bunch of different pretty images of glowing jellyfish and other aquatic animals um, in the deep depths of the sea and what it what makes them glow are these uh, luminescent proteins and so a luminescent protein so we have luminescent proteins um, and what they are are proteins that respond to the presence of ATP which is the main energy driving molecule within the cell so they respond to ATP which is adenosine triphosphate and they undergo a conformational change so they physically change their shape because of the ATP and break off one of the phosphates and become ADP or adenosine triphos or diphosphate. And so then we have a little phosphate group that is broken off and it's used the energy of that bond breaking in order to create this conformational change. Then when the ADP and the phosphate group are released, um, this protein is able to fall back to its original shape because this was an energetically unstable state that it was already in, it falls back to its original shape and in doing so it releases a certain wavelength of light. Uh, so this releases light, which then can be measured. And uh, the last type of reporter that I'm going to talk about and probably the most commonly used type of reporter are fluorescent proteins. And one that you've probably heard thrown around a bit is uh, GFP. So we have um, fluorescent proteins. And so with that we have GFP, green fluorescent protein, which is derived from jellyfish. And how this works, we have a protein that responds. I'm going to follow through with a uh, GFP case. So we have GFP and it responds to blue light. So if I shine light of <coughs> around 501 nanometer wavelength or blue light onto GFP, it's also going to undergo a conformational change similar to how ATP drove the conformation change in the luminescent protein. It's going to change the shape of GFP so it's going to become a different shape and in doing so it's being put into an energetically unfavorable state and so when it falls back to its original shape it's going to release light um, but because some of the energy was used up as say like heat of and the actual kinetics of moving the molecule some of the energy is lost so the wavelength of the light that was shown on, shined on it um, becomes longer and in becoming longer it changes the color that we see so the actual color that we see coming off of this is going to be green which has a wavelength of around 511 nanometers um, so for practicality purposes so we had what was this this was 501 nanometer wavelength uh, coming in and we have 511 nanometers coming out uh, for practicality purposes that is a very small window which would yield a lot of noise in the data that we collect so um, in practice we actually shine wavelength of around 485 nanometers so 485 nanometers and then we record at a wavelength of around 525 nanometers and what that does is we have a larger difference between these two groups the stimulating light and the recording light so we're able to um, better spread out the data between the two and reduce the amount of noise of our recording so we can get a better recording
So even though it's not at its most energetically favorable, which would be the 501 and 511 nanometer wavelength light coming in and out, um, this is a better recording set by using this distanced wavelength light set. So just to sum it up a little bit, we have uh, four main different types of reporters that are used. We have our chromoproteins, which are just the pigmented proteins to be that can be used. We have our chromogen, which is actually something that is added to a system that already produces a protein. Um, and by doing so, it modifies that protein to create a different output, which can then be recorded. We have our luminescent proteins, which respond to the presence of ATP and change their conformation, thus releasing light and making beautiful colors. And we also have fluorescent proteins, such as GFP, RFP, which is red fluorescent protein, um, which respond to light that is input into the system and respond by releasing a different wavelength of light that can then be recorded. And these can be used for testing the uh, effectiveness of our transfer of our plasmid into E. coli to see if it actually got in there. It can be used to see how much of our protein product is being made, thus the relative strengthness of our promoter. And it can also just test to see if whether or not our protein is being coded for at all.